Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you to the second episode of the Carbonization Path series of events that is again focused on carbon capture and storage, CCS. The event is organized by Spirit Italian Section, and we have the pleasure of having distinguished managers of multinational companies as an important Italian university this evening. Let me introduce myself. I'm Massimiliano Giamberini, and it's a pleasure to be the moderator of also this second event. Currently, I hold the role of faculty liaison for SP Italian section. After a quick introduction regarding SP, I will manage the presentations of the speaker and finally the QA session. With me in the control room, there is Luca Motti, the current digital director of our association. I want to thank, to thank those who are still following us after the first interesting event in November and also the new joiners. I hope you can all understand the value of the speech we will attend. Our aim as Italian section is to consolidate the historical partnership with companies in the upstream sector and to develop a path regarding a low carbon energy sources. Um, it is a, impo very important for us to collect disseminated next technical knowledge for issues related to the energy sector. Our aim is also to develop, again, regarding low carbon energy sources to support the global, the goal of global energy transition. I advise you all to follow our social networks in order to be always updated on our initiatives. Our association is very active, organizing various events and workshops. Our interest in sustainability and energy transition issues comes from afar. As you can see from both the collection of posters on, right, on the left and also all these topic lists on the right. The We Are Spay hashtag has recently been used by FP International to highlight the strong sense of belonging to our community. Let me talk very, very briefly about some aspects related to membership. The data in this slide are related to year end 2020. In Italy, we are more than 285 professionals and more than 200 students. We are present in the University of Sapienza di Roma and Politecnico di Torino. We periodically also send some service to our members to understand their preferences in order to organize and plan events and initiatives that are of great interest to them. There are so many advantages of being part of our community. At the bottom, of, in fact, of this slide, you can find the link where you can join for those who are not already. Now, to, to tonight's event with a deep focus in CCS is therefore linked to issues of decarbonization and energy transition. This is why it is included in the SPE Gaia Sustainability Program. You can see more details on SPE Gaia Sustainability Program that you could find out in the link below the YouTube video of this event. Clicking on the link, you can open or download the slides discovering all the main aspects of the SPE Sustainability Program. I want only to underline that this event deals with energy transition topics that are so envir environmental sustainability. The introduction is over and the event so could start. This is the poster. And I want also to remind you that this is the second event of a series of initiatives, so-called decarbonization path. Now you can see the agenda that is as follows. So we assist an introduction about this series of events by our chairman, Paolo Carnevale. Then the main technical speeches divided in two main macro categories, subsurface and HSC topics, with the presence of internationally renowned speakers. Finally, a Q&A session. Only the last two details. With regard to the last topic, so I would like to point out that under the YouTube video, there is a link that refers to the question forms, where each of you can submit questions or curiosities 
uh, to one or more speaker. The quest form is already active, so please, and will also remain so until the end of the webinar. So I advise you to ask questions or curiosity during the event itself. Now, last details about also below, again, below the YouTube video, there is a second link that refers instead to the feedback question, where you can express uh, your comments or opinions about this event. Now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Paolo Carnevale, CEO at any project and SP Italian section chairman. Thanks, Paolo. Paolo, scusami, you are muted, I think. Again, muted. I don't know why. Sorry for the inconvenience. Only one minute we can repair for it. We are waiting for uh, to repair the inconvenience by the technical uh, team in uh, in Sala Consiglio of any progetti. Only some aspects, please. Okay, so there are some technical issues, so I would suggest to move on to the next speaker. So, Massimiliano, if you can introduce our next speaker, please. Yes, for sure. Uh, now, so we can start, uh, sorry for the inconvenience, we can repair after uh, these technical speeches. So, we start with Marco Brignoli, geomechanical characterization expert at uh, ENI, for its focus on depleted reservoirs. They give us the floor is yours, Marco. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Massimiliano. So let's start uh, this, this uh, presentation concerning the CCS, at least some aspects of CCS into a uh, depleted reservoir. In the next uh, 15 minutes, I will go through this agenda. Just a short introduction about uh, uh, pinpointing the main CCS hubs and cluster uh, existing in the world, then moving um, why depleted oil and gas uh, fields are so interesting. 
Then I will uh, put on on the slide on a slide some pros and cons uh, of a reservoir, depleted reservoirs versus saline aquifer. Just a matter that that can uh, raise some question from you. And then we'll be, uh, we will move into the, the technical, more technical part, that is, uh, which is the integrated subsurface activities and workflows that we in ENI are following as a subsurface group to work on the uh, feasibility of CO2 disposal into the depleted reservoir. And uh, focus will be given, of course, uh, on the geomechanics of the CO2 injection. And we will see something about uh, the overburden geomechanics and three themes that are particularly relevant when, when um, performing uh, this kind of a, a geomechanical evaluation for a storage property that is cap rock integrity, uh, uh, thermal induced fracturing and full stability. And finally, we will uh, drive some conclusion. Uh, this this picture taken from uh, the uh, final the, the yearly report of the Global CCS Institutes highlights some, not entirely all, the main CCS hubs and clusters existing in the world in 2020. Uh, if you if you look at a little bit in detail, you will recognize that the only, of course. Not all the projects are uh, represented in, in this figure, but the major one. And uh, I would like to uh, highlight that only one is related to depleted oil and gas reservoir. And it, it is the Portos uh, project, that is the use of existing depleted gas field outside the, the port of Rotterdam to dispose a uh, quantity of CO2 generated by the uh, activity in, uh, in the port itself. Uh, this does not mean that depleted reservoir are not considered into, into this picture. For instance, ENI has been awarded a, a license to uh, um, appraise and develop a depleted gas field in the Irish Sea. And we have also uh, in Italy uh, an ongoing feasibility activity to evaluate the, the potential of, uh, of um, depleted reservoir in the Adriatic uh, Sea to be used as, as CO2 disposal. Why depleted oil and gas fields? As this, this figure uh, represents the uh, storage resources in terms of millions of tons of the major oil and gas fields, always coming from the Global CCS Institute report 2020. Uh, the numbers are impressive uh, in the sense, uh, despite the fact that these numbers are lower, but greatly lower of the saline aquifer capability, nevertheless, um, we, we have to say that uh, the amount of million of tons available in depleted reservoirs can account for a very large amount of the CO2 that can be captured and, and disposed of. So it's not only a, a marginal field of application, the one of, of the depleted reservoir. So now let's move more on, on a kind of comparison between depleted fields and saline aquifer. This is a table I prepared. There's no uh, pretension to be exhaustive. Uh, and for each of the two targets, uh, I try to uh, put both the pros and the cons. And, and from, from it is, is the feeling that there is no a winning uh, point for which depleted fields are better than saline aquifer and vice versa. So each of the two solutions has its own pros and cons. So of course, the volume capacity is larger in saline aquifer. The knowledge is better in depleted reservoir. Uh, we can reuse, for instance, some existing infrastructure, but is in the same uh, point, those existing infrastructure can be also uh, not suitable uh, for, for whatever reasons. 
Well integrity is an issue in depleted aquifers, but well integrity is depleted. Uh, well integrity is also an issue in saline aquifers, because sometimes saline aquifers has been crossed um, to develop some uh, um, existing reservoir below the saline aquifer itself. So uh, what are called the legacy well exist uh, as well in the saline aquifer. So. Uh, that's that's why uh, um, there is no uh, conclusion that gives uh, um, an answer pro and cons uh, uh, between saline aquifer and depleted reservoirs, and that's it's worth investigating the capabilities of an existing depleted reservoir to accommodate CO two. So now let's move to the subsurface. Uh, of course, we need to concentrate on subsurface because with limited amount of time, we cannot treat all the chain of the CCS. And one thing that is different from the standard um, reservoir study in the oil and gas industry sense is that we are dealing with the, the, what is termed subsurface storage complex. Subsurface storage complex, this is a good good definition that I found on, uh, on the website uh, in the site of NATL uh, US. It, what, what is, it's a storage formation, what we call generally a reservoir, with at least one, but usually multiple, continuous break on original scale ceiling formation that are able to keep the CO2 um, disposed in the reservoir units. So th those, those uh, ceiling formation, we call it either cap rock or seals. So in, in, in the next slides, whatever the term that will be used, we will, I'm referring to the, uh, to this uh, uh, existing formation. So um, when dealing to the uh, suitability of a storage complex, uh, the integrated activities is very complex as well. So it's not only a matter of reservoir, it's not only a matter of, of uh, drilling, is is always a, an integrated or fluid assurance or, or surface facilities or whatever. It's a truly integrated activity. I, I pointed uh, five, ma uh, four major uh, topics, namely the reservoir, so the, the, the really the, the disposal uh, unit, containment, so we said before, cap rock and seals and the faults that are bounding the receiving formations, well integrity, that is in the depleted field, we have several wells. Uh, we must assure that uh, the, the wells are not leaking um, and do not, uh, uh, behave like a path for the CO2 escaping the reservoir. And of course, a full set of monitoring, measurement and verification issues that has to be uh, put in place for the uh, entire life of the disposal site. And you can read and, and see listed some of the activity, uh, some are usual, some are more specific, specific for the CO2 description that are above, oh sorry, below each of the main, of the main topics. What does it mean in terms of, of the workflow? For instance, this is a very broad summary of a typical workflow we assume in ENI. So starting from the screening of the depleted reservoir uh, to, to evaluate the capacity, the injectivity, the containment, then we, we work on the 3D model in, in terms of uh, um, both static geologic model and dynamic model to evaluate the injection profile, the plume evolution. Then these models are fed with uh, other information which are, which are uh, of course necessary like PVT, permeability, geochemistry, rock mechanics and so on and so forth. Those models are uh, bind together with uh, with the geomechanics geomechanical related one that we will see more in detail in the next slides, and of course, as as said, 
um, we have to include also the well integrity assessment, uh, which is one of the uh, of the major part in a, in a depleted uh, gas field the CO2 project. Then once we have completed all the set of of the studies, uh, we can move to the application. So we uh, we can set up a suitable monitoring activity, designing pilot uh, projects, and after the pilot project, uh, move to a full scale application uh, like uh, uh, other uh, development uh, project uh, plan. So let's enter uh, a little bit in uh, um, into the geomechanics of uh, the storage complex. Uh, whatever we uh, do in the subsurface in terms of injection, whether it is water, produce water, cuttings, hydrogens, methane, or CO2, we induce both variation of pressure and temperature. Those variation of pressure and temperature uh, induce in the subsurface volume variation and stress variation. And we have to add this, this little piece of, of course, related to CO2, that CO2 with respect to other uh, fluids, like for instance, uh, water, induce also some reaction into the formation. So once we uh, have this generating mechanism, what we want to do is to evaluate the answer of the system in terms of cap rock integrity, thermally induced fracture, and for stability to guarantee that the storage complex uh, will keep safely the CO2 uh, in the subsurface. Then we can divide the, 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 the workflow and the analysis into three major tasks. One is to look of what happens in the overburden. We can use, for instance, um, or we we plan monitoring of a burden. Uh, the technology reported here is the seismic survey. Uh, combining seismic survey at different time, we will have a figure of the evolution of the overburden in terms of, uh, of properties. And we can also model the overburden. For instance, on the right side is reported that the result of one simulation that we uh, uh, run to evaluate if during the primary production of the field, some uh, areas of the cap rock could be already proximal uh, to the uh, critical condition or near, near to the critical condition, which might pose a, a warning on the um, evaluation of the uh, that specific reservoir as a specific uh, CO2 disposal site. But we can also run this type of simulations uh, as well, simulating the injection and looking for uh, variation that are uh, significant and impairing to some extent the capabilities of the cap rock to withstand the pressure and eventually fail and leave the CO2 escape. Uh, I have to say that in general, uh, in, in the uh, depleted reservoir projects, um, the, the CO2 is injected uh, below the original uh, reservoir pressure. Um, why? Uh, because once, once the target uh, uh, volume of the CO2 is reached uh, and, and there is no uh, need to inject further CO2, uh, in general, the, the original pressure is not, is not reached. So from that point of view, uh, there, is, there is a certain safety margin uh, with respect to the structure because the, the structure has already withstand a certain pressure that is generally greater than the than the CO2 disposal one, but in any case, uh, uh, we can uh, well we can uh, we can we can uh, do uh, from very simple models uh, 1D mechanic we call it 1D mechanical model 
for the cap rock failure envelope evaluation, like uh, very simply uh, summarized the, into this, in this cartoon, the closest we are on this line, that is the failure line, the more risky the situation is, or we can build 3D geomechanical model and uh, one section of a 3D model is reported on the right side, where we can simulate the injection and look for the displacement and the deformation inside the reservoir and in the cap rock. In this case, the cap rock is here above because we wanted to look at, at the um, injection point and check if the uh, failure condition are met or not in the, in, in the cap rock itself as well. Um, since we are injecting uh, CO2 as, as a gas, what happens uh, when it reaches deformations? It expands and it's cool and, and it's cooling. So at the, at the level of the uh, injection formation um, here, we will have a certain delta temperature, a uh, uh, decrease of the temperature. And the decrease of the temperature in general induces variation in the stresses, thus uh, improving the facility to generate uh, uh, hydraulic fracture. The stress is reduces, the uh, fracture pressure reduces, so it's easier to fracture uh, uh, the rock. Uh, what, what we do then is, well, what we do, what is done in general to, to simulate this problem is to map the temperature. Um, is, this is on the right, is a very simple, simple uh, reservoir plus cap rock uh, two-dimensional uh, finite element model and once we have the map of the temperature profile we can uh, evaluate the state of stress inside the cooled region and the undisturbed one and check if fracture condition are met both in the reservoir and in the cap rock uh, for the case reported here despite the cooling uh, no, uh, uh, no fracture condition are met in 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 this uh, in this kind of simulation. Well, we have talked up uh, up to now to, about uh, the cap rock, but the reservoir or the disposal uh, unit is also bounded sometime by fault. So. When we are planning to inject something, and especially CO2, uh, we would like uh, to avoid any potential destabilization of the fault. Because the destabilization of the fault might induce first the reopening of existing fracture, thus contributing to the pathway and the potentially uh, uh, leaving space to the CO2 to uh, reach uh, other horizons or in the worst case, the surface. And of course, the other is to uh, avoid any kind of induced seismicity in case the fault is prone to uh, generating micro earthquakes. The workflow that we used uh, in, in this kind of, of, a, of a study is summarized in, in this slide. So we, we start from, from the fluid dynamic model with all the pressure profile injection. This is a, a, a production, but it can work in injection. Uh, we build the suitable geomechanical model for the storage complex. And as a first analysis, once we have the, the field of stresses at the beginning of uh, production, at the end of production of the field, at the start of the injection and uh, during the injection of the CO2, we can map the, the, the stresses onto the fault selected to be analyzed and uh, look at if we are in critical condition or not. Uh, the case represented here is, is a very stable fault. Uh, blue means stable, red means potentially unstable. And if, if we recognize um, potential uh, critical problems of one of this, uh, of this uh, surface, we can also explicitly represent the, the fault as a two surface in a finite element code and really work in detail to look for uh, possible critical zones. 
of course we can also evaluate we could also evaluate if the case which is the amount of displacement that can be um, observed on, on on a fault so the slip tendency analysis is a, is a, is nowadays standard procedure in in the injection workflow for for ENI not only for CO2 but for also other uh, injection problem we can use uh, simplified analytical and probabilistic fault models uh, for a very uh, let's say first pass uh, analysis and build suitable 3D models uh, explicitly uh, using the, the, the fault surfaces if there are some critical situation that can uh, be further investigated. And uh, of course, this is not only uh, an analysis to evaluate if, but also, for instance, if we change the parameters of injection, we can uh, see how the system reacts so uh, the geomechanical models can help also the fluid dynamic models to, to optimize the parameters to avoid whatever type of, of potential problem one could have uh, seen in, uh, in the simulations. So this leads me uh, to the conclusion of this very uh, brief and, and I hope uh, clear description of the process uh, that that we uh, are carrying on to um, describe the behavior of a storage complex so first of course depleted oil gas uh, fields allow a large quantity of co2 to be disposed in the sub surface so uh, that's that's why um, they are they are under consideration and they are, uh, are, are, uh, there are several projects ongoing um, in, into this area. Of course, understanding the CO2 di dis disposal project in depleted reservoir, uh, it's slightly different than in the saline aquifer, but in the same case requires an effective and efficient integration of a, a lot of specialistic competencies. And uh, what I have highlighted in this presentation is the geomechanical competencies and how they, they play a role in the, the characterization of the complex in the modeling. And uh, as, as I told you, as the last case, uh, working uh, strictly with the other speci specialists uh, on each of the other uh, pieces of work uh, we together we contribute to highlight potential criticalities and identify uh, the, the optimal uh, solution. And as I repeated uh, several times, uh, that the integrated workflows that I try to summarize in the presentation are uh, uh, currently used in the progress of the ongoing uh, any CCS uh, projects. Thanks for uh, your uh, your attention, uh, and I have to thank all the uh, ENI colleagues involved in the, in the subsurface CCS project in, in geomechanics. And uh, well, feel free to uh, put your questions uh, on the link that Massimiliano uh, told you before. And uh, thanks again for your uh, attention. Again, good thanks, evening. Marco. Thanks, Marco, again. Uh, now, sorry for the technical IT inconvenience happened uh, before. I want to give the floor again to Paolo Carnevale, CEO at Any Progetti and uh, Director of SP Italian Section. Please. Okay, thank you very much, Massimiliano. I hope that now you, you can hear me. Right? Yes, right, yes. Okay, okay. okay. Because uh, whatever you can test the system before, as we have done, uh, there is some. Uh, that goes wrong always. It is, it, it is, I think, because of the Murphy law. Anyway, I will try to be brief uh, because uh, uh, I miss my slot. Uh, <laughs> so I um, just want to um, recap uh, why uh, now uh, we are focusing on this uh, on these topics. As you as you know, uh, this year, uh, Spain Italian section, in addition to the traditional oil and gas uh, topics. Uh, is focusing uh, basically the, uh, the attention on the energy transition. And this is also in line with the global vision of the Spain International uh, uh, that launched the Gaia Sustainability Program, as you know. 
So the decarbonization path is uh, a series of four events that we have launched for this year, uh, from uh, since uh, since uh, last year, to be honest, and where various professionals can share their view and their knowledge uh, regarding different topics, such as uh, carbon capture and storage. It was the first event. Carbon capture and utilization, blue products and blue hydrogen in the supply chain, um, bioproducts and green refinance, and other topics. And this is really something that uh, uh, even the audience uh, has uh, uh, responded in a very positive way because uh, in the first event that we had in last November, uh, we had more than six, uh, 600 live participants and more than 1,800 visualization of the event recording. So. Uh, this event is focused on the subsurface insights, as uh, Marco Brignoli has already uh, anticipated in the first event, and the, especially in the HSE challenges and stakeholder management, it is something that we have to take uh, in, uh, in due consideration when proposing uh, uh, CCS projects uh, around the world. Uh, why CCS? Uh, again, CCS is a, is a key technology uh, for removing the carbon dioxide uh, when we generate power from the AV industry or from the air itself, uh, it is a very good input to assist uh, the other industrial processes. Uh, it can be compressed and injected into the reservoir. Uh, and this is especially, uh, this is quite important, is one of the main uh, ways uh, where uh, we can reach the 2050 targets of the uh, reduce of the global carbon emissions uh, according to what uh, has been stated by the Paris Agreement on climate change in, in uh, 2015. So, uh, and we need also to be fast and to increase the volume of the projects uh, that are related to CCS. If uh, uh, the International Energy Agency is estimating that uh, from the 40 million of tons that we are currently capturing and storing uh, in the reservoir, we need to increase for uh, to jump for 200 fold to 8 gigatons by by 2050. Um, and this is also a very, uh, I think, is the only technology uh, so far that is helping the AV industry to uh, the, the the famous r 2 based sectors to be completely decarbonized in the in the short and mid term. Uh, just to remember that basically uh, the 20% of the overall uh, carbon emissions are coming from uh, from this kind of industry that uh, uh, that are cement factories, are uh, glass makers, uh, iron and steel industry, petrochemical complex. Uh, so, um, so this is why we are focusing on this uh, decarbonization path series of events, and this is also why we are also uh, thinking of the stakeholders' perspective. Uh, because the uh, the oil and gas company, the energy companies have uh, remarkable reputation and exposure uh, on this on, on these topics. So, because of, um, at the end of the day, the energy companies are strongly committed and responsible for the sustainability of these solutions in the long term towards the local communities. And this is one of the aspects that will be touched by the uh, by the. Uh, in, uh, contribution that we have uh, in the today event. So uh, I think that uh, uh, just for uh, an introduction uh, is enough. So I leave the speech to Massimiliano in order to, in, to introduce the, the second lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paolo, to be here and uh, for your intervention. Now, so you we can continue with the, the predefined agenda. Now I introduce Philippe Legrand. CCU US uh, Subsurface Manager at Total. His speech is regarding the NEP project with a focus on saline aquifers. The floor is yours. Thanks, Philippe. Thank you, Massimiliano. Um, good afternoon or good evening to everybody. Thanks to welcome me for this uh, presentation. Yeah, definitely, uh, I, I'd like to present you this uh, UK project uh, at the east coast of uh, UK called the Northern Endurance Partnership. Um, it changed uh, a, lo a lot of time of names. It was uh, initially the Clean, oops, the Clean Gas uh, Project and the Teesside Project. And now today it's a Northern Endurance Partnership. So I will give you the UK context that allows this uh, project to, to pop up. 
then I will focus on the uh, endurance. Endurance is the name of the structure that will uh, be used as a store. It's a saline aquifer, a huge uh, structure. And I will have some world regarding risk assessments. Uh, we are using bow tie analysis. Uh, we are working with the risk tech uh, company and um, some world regarding uh, monitoring MMV. <clears throat> Uh, try to go for the next slide. Try with the mouse, Philippe. Clicking on, with the mouse. The mouse. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so this is a, a, a slide showing uh, the um, the UK picture. So uh, UK is keen to uh, respect the COP21 uh, objective and uh, to have uh, zero carbon emission in 2050. So it's an ambitious uh, uh, objective uh, that is shared in uh, many European countries and uh, we all know that it is uh, <coughs> challenging. <coughs> this slide to show some uh, some figures. So. Uh, basically, from now to uh, 2050, the electricity demand, the energy demand will double. And the uh, UK has to cope with that by uh, not increasing the uh, use of uh, hydro, uh, hydrocarbon, so gas and uh, oil, of course, and uh, <clears throat> trying to, uh, to use, of course, uh, more green energy. Or if uh, some gas is uh, <clears throat> is used for a power plant, for instance, then uh, CCUS has to be uh, used to uh, store the CO2. So one figure is very interesting is the total uh, <clears throat> emission for UK is 176 million tons per year. This is what is forecast for uh, 2050. And uh, <clears throat> You, you understand that uh, this figure is a huge figure. And for instance, the net uh, zero, uh, the Northern Endurance project will lead uh, with a maximum of 20, 25 million ton per year. So it's something which uh, will represent one over seven uh, part of the uh, total UK emission. If I go to the next uh, slide. Yep, this is showing the map where uh, all the CCUS uh, projects are uh, located. So you have uh, two in the West Coast and three in the East Coast. So our, our project is there. So it's still called uh, Net Zero T side. And in fact, Net, uh, Northern Endurance project will be uh, the uh, sum of these two projects. So we will gather the emission of the two cluster here, T side and number side, and uh, store the CO2 into a single uh, store named uh, Endurance. So Net Zero T side is uh, the anchor project is a CCGT that will produce uh, around 2 million tons per year. And we will gather the industrial network all uh, around this uh, CCGT to reach in a first phase 4 million tons and in the next step 10 million tons. Amberside will uh, as a, is an important cluster that will uh, <coughs> provide uh, hydrogen uh, uh, production, and the uh, emission is the forecast is very uh, high, to up to 30 million ton per year or even more. Next slide. Okay, this is showing how we uh, gather two uh, clusters, so net zero T side in uh, one hand and <coughs> on, uh, amber side in the other hand. And we, <coughs> two pipeline will uh, tie this uh, cluster to the endurance project. This project is now operated by uh, a BP on behalf of uh, five, uh, six companies. So BP, uh, of course, Shell, Total, ENI, Equinor on national grid. Uh, it was previously um, operated by uh, OGCI, 
that gave the floor to uh, to, to BP to, uh, to to follow up uh, this uh, project. So I repeat, endurance is a saline aquifer, and uh, <coughs> the how we select uh, uh, endurance. In fact, a screening of the uh, different potential uh, candidates for storage. Uh, has started uh, very early uh, in in UK, so starting in 2010, something like that. And uh, <clears throat> of course, depleted gas fields were evaluated, and uh, one of them being uh, AWIT, for instance, a field operated by uh, ENI, and uh, of course, saline aquifer uh, prospects. So we select uh, endurance because it's a very important, it's a huge structure. Uh, just to give you a figure of the structure, if you consider the brine that is within the structure above the spill point is 26 billion of barrels. So if it were filled by uh, hydrocarbons, that would be a giant field. We consider uh, different options, so depleted gas field, and um, as uh, Marco was saying in the previous uh, speech, uh, Depleted gas fields are quite difficult to manage because of the Joule Thompson effect, and we didn't find the way to have an economical project with uh, with AWIT so, so far. But the future is belonging to the depleted gas field, I think. So the characteristic of endurance, so it's a large, very large anticline, so it's 20 kilometer long, uh, 8 kilometer wide, and uh, as I said, uh, 26 billion of uh, brine contained in this uh, structure. One of the particularities is that this reservoir is connected, is a regionally uh, very extended uh, reservoir, a Triassic uh, reservoir. Its uh, <coughs> thickness is ranging between 200 to, uh, to 300 meters. Quite good reservoir. And the characteristic of uh, endurance is that it is connected to a, an outcrop, a subcrop. So the reservoir is subcropping, subcropping uh, to the seafloor, and it's leading to a specific uh, monitoring, as we will see in a few uh, in a few slides. So some figures regarding uh, endurance. So it's a very large anticline, as I was saying. <coughs> One eight, uh, 140 bar, so of course we can inject uh, CO2 in dense phase. The brine is hypersaline with uh, a rate of 250,000 ppm, even 300,000 ppm. <coughs> uh, it's a shallow reservoir at 1,000 meters. Temperature is 56 degrees, and we have an excellent reservoir with 90% plus uh, net to growth, uh, quite fair uh, porosity and permeability. And as I said, uh, a large uh, thickness, 250 meters in average uh, all over. So we estimated the capacity of this uh, store at 450 uh, million tons. And here you have a seismic line uh, highlighting a cross section along the axis of the structure. More regarding the geology, so we have a bunch of well within the structure, so it has been, of course, explored. So we have legacy well on the structure, exploration well, and it has been appraised, the last well has been appraised for CO2 purpose, for CO2 storage purpose, in 2013 by National Green. And all around there are wells that are targeting deeper reservoirs, but giving some <coughs> nice calibration for the bunter uh, for the reservoir uh, extension. And what is very important for uh, a saline aquifer storage is the lateral connectivity. We need to know how, <clears throat> how far the uh, regional aquifer is connected to allow the pressure dissipation into uh, the uh, structure. And this is one of the uncertainty we have. <clears throat> and if you look carefully, you have three wells there that are located there excellent quality on all the well around are of uh, lower quality so you have the porosity log here and it's show, showing a, a quite systematic degradation of the reservoir 
which is linked to uh, a light uh, cementation of the reservoir. And <clears throat> it's absolutely amazing to see that this um, transform of the reservoir is uh, clearly seen observed on the seismic data with the phase uh, reversal. So we have a change of polarity <coughs> uh, north and south of the uh, reservoir. So we have here a structure with a nice reservoir, and it seems that laterally the extension of the uh, reservoir to the north, to the west, to the to the south is polluted by allied uh, cementation. So the connectivity, the regional connectivity could be poor. And we don't know. This is uh, one of the uncertainty of the of the project. <clears throat> the project is in terms of phasing, so we will start with a 4 million ton uh, per year with only T side. And uh, let's say five, six years after that, we will ramp up to 10 million ton, including uh, the amber side participation. After that, there will be uh, other, uh, other phases, up to 20 maybe, or plus uh, million ton per year. And we will start our first phase with uh, five injector wells, so let's say one million ton per uh, <clears throat> one MTPA per um, per well. And with uh, four million ton per year, we estimate it that no brine production will be needed to accommodate the pressure dissipation. After that, when the project will uh, ramp up, I think uh, one slide is missing went too far, yeah. So when we will uh, reach the 10 million ton per year, definitively we will need some brine production. And this is the blue dot that you have here. So we will have uh, production of brine to accommodate the pressure. And of course, if we continue to ramp up 15 million ton per year, we uh, will add uh, <coughs> a brine producer. Another solution is instead of producing brine is to have a a cluster of uh, store and um, endurance is uh, close to um, to heat little brother or sister so uh, <clears throat> smaller structure uh, that has been uh, have been drilled uh, mostly of them and we consider that we can tie them to uh, endurance so we can maybe uh, continue to inject the co2 into the uh, different stores so uh, Summing the different store without having the need to produce uh, to produce the brine, which can have uh, some uh, detrimental environmental uh, impact. So we speed up a little. I think time is. We have here um, a risk assessment, and uh, definitively, it's a classical one. Now we know that we have to address a geological uh, risk, a legacy well uh, risk, and I think this has been perfectly addressed with, uh, within Marco's uh, presentation. One thing that is specific to endurance is uh, this all crops. So we have to, you can understand that the pressure increase will uh, lead to a, a brine flow out of the out crop, and we have to monitor uh, this uh, brine flow of, of the outcrop, and the outcrop could be a several square kilometer at the seabed. So this is something we are considering to, to monitor, and honestly, we don't know exactly how we will do it. Lenders, uh, AUV, any idea will be uh, welcome uh, if you have uh, considered this uh, particular risk. Next one. To address the different risks, we uh, use uh, volta analysis. So <clears throat> this is a classical scheme of uh, the containment risk. So we have the seal risk, the uh, fault risk, the uh, legacy well risk, and the development well risk also. So each of them has been addressed through uh, volta analysis that we will show uh, to, in the next slide. On each of these paths has been uh, systematically address, and we try also to have a semi-quantitative approach to give an idea of the uh, risk, but also 
of the impact, what could be the leakage for a legacy well, for instance? Is it one ton per, uh, per day, per year, per month? We want to give some uh, order of magnitude of what a leakage could be. So this is a classical bow tie analysis. So this is a very synthetic uh, view for, uh, <coughs> uh, for the different fields. So for the geological one, injection well, the legacy well. And for each of them, we try to address the, uh, the risk. And if I go further in details, if you uh, go through this uh, different uh, risk, we uh, analyze them all uh, pass by pass by this one, this one, and so on. And we try to um, define the different mitigation uh, action plans that could uh, mitigate the, the, the risk. It's a classical approach, but uh, the fact that it is systematic help us to, uh, to not to forget anything uh, during the process. Uh, we, <clears throat> this slide is to, sh to show, to highlight how we can address uh, quantitative uh, uh, risk meaning to give some figure to what could be, for instance, a leakage. So I took the example of a legacy well. We consider different paths of leakage, and for each of them, we try to assess different assumptions. Of course, they are wrong, but they are giving out of magnitude, and we can frame the uncertainty with that by assuming permeability in the cement and giving, uh, well, using the Darcy law, to evaluate what could be the volume of CO2 that could be uh, that could leak through the different paths. And this semi-quantitative approach is quite interesting to uh, to, to, to reach the uh, request of the regulator that is a request to have an idea of what could be uh, uh, the, the risk in terms of, uh, of volume. Uh, sorry, the, it goes too quick. Yep. So a MMV a mo monitoring is um, is a key for uh, a storage. Uh, as uh, Marco was saying, this is something fundamental to. Uh, for uh, our safety, but also for um, the regulator. So one of the basic tools is uh, 4D monitoring that we will use systematically. And just to for the to, to let uh, you inform, we will have some issue because uh, we plan to have a, 4D, a classical 4D monitoring, even using high resolution seismic acquisition. But unfortunately, close on even on overlaying the uh, endurance structure, there will be a wind farm. And you can imagine that uh, with a wind turbine every uh, one to two kilometers, to have a, a 4D shot would be quite difficult. So we will have maybe to use nodes uh, where uh, in an area where the seafloor is quite unstable, meaning that we have sand dunes that are moving quite uh, quickly and regularly, and uh, 4D in this uh, condition uh, would be quite uh, challenging. So we are trying to negotiate with the operator of the uh, wind farm to, uh, to have some space uh, available to shoot uh, a classical stoid 3D server. Uh, a part of that, we will have the monitoring that we use in all uh, CCUS, uh, CCS uh, projects uh, worldwide. So, <clears throat> of course, all the well will be safely monitored. We will have uh, <clears throat> DS uh, fiber optic uh, observation in each uh, of the well. The structure itself and endurance, so there will be five injectors, and we will drill an observer well, and <clears throat> an observer well that will monitor the uh, pressure at uh, all level and uh, saturation log at the systematically. 
we will have uh, ILT, so uh, <clears throat> injection login tool, uh, systematically. Uh, and for the hard crop, we uh, plan so far to uh, address this, uh, the issue of the hard crop, the flow coming, coming out of the hard crop with lenders. So we will have uh, um, lenders, uh, so boxes at the sea floor, trying to measure uh, some parameters giving uh, highlighting the flow, if any, coming out of the outcrop, so pH, uh, just ac acoustic uh, detection, um, spectrometry, and so on, and so on, uh, plus uh, AUV. And this is an open question, how to monitor uh, a flow of our square kilometers, that's uh, a big issue that uh, we, are, we are still working on it. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I will uh, end my presentation here. Sorry to to be so long. So one of the some conclusion on that is, um, as Marco was saying, there is a benchmark, positive benchmark regarding saline aquifer uh, store. Uh, it works. We know that it works, and uh, we have positive uh, feedback, for instance, from uh, Ekinor in Norway, uh, Quest in Canada, and so on. So um, we hope that it will work. Um, the challenge is uh, it depends. The, the good behavior of the store depends of the connectivity of the aquifer. This is an, uh, an unknown, an uncertainty that we have to deal with. And for that, we need a, a period of observation, a dynamic appraisal of the store of at least, uh, let's say, five years to give a figure to be sure that we can ramp up in a safe, uh, in a safe manner. On saline aquifer, so we uh, inject into a regional aquifer. So question, what is the storage complex? What is the limit of the storage complex? For instance, the outcrop should be uh, included in the storage complex because um, we inject CO2 and it has an impact on the uh, outcrop with maybe uh, brine flowing out of, uh, of it. But what are the limits uh, to the south, to the north? Uh, because pressure is expanding. So we will, for instance, uh, maybe impact wells that are uh, 20 kilometers uh, far from, uh, from endurance. So dynamic appraisal would be uh, really a must before going forward. <clears throat> and uh, strangely, we, um, in UK especially, we don't have uh, firm regulation regarding how uh, to manage CO2 store and how to monitor it. So, it's a constructive discussion that we have with ODA, the regulator, oil and gas authority in UK, to define the rule. And of course, uh, these rules are very strict. Uh, no molecule of CO2 has to go out of this uh, store. And I definitively finish there, thanking uh, the organizer for uh, inviting me to this uh, speech. And I thank, of course, the partners that allow this uh, presentation. So BP Total, ENI, Shell, Equino, and National Grid. Thank Thanks, you. Philippe. I really appreciated your speech and your participation. Now, so we can start uh, with the second part, uh, focused on HSC topic. I introduce Sabina Bici, professor at La Sapienza University of Rome. Her speech is regarding monitoring. I want also to all the attendees uh, that the question form is active. So if you have any question, you can continue to do it. Thank you so much. And uh, please, Sabina, it's your turn. OK, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I would like to start this presentation uh, um, speaking about the um, the um, monitoring plan as it is a request from the European uh, Directive, which is uh, at the present one of the most complete regulations about geological storage. And then I would like to present the state of the art uh, in some uh, some specific aspect of the of the monitoring 
uh, that was uh, developed all over the world and also in Europe in the last uh, 20 years. And uh, what and then uh, I would like to highlight what are the main aspects that will be deployed in the future. Um, even uh, in the light of uh, the regulation itself, and then uh, I would like to propose some, some conclusions. Uh, in 2009, uh, European Parliament uh, published this, um, this um, directive, uh, which deals with uh, CO2 geological storage, and um, also uh, produce the, um, the guidance documents and dedicate a lot of uh, space uh, in the description of the of the um, of the monitoring plan. Um, the directive uh, define uh, the main steps of the uh, of the um, of the CO2 storage. Uh, define the, the assessment, uh, the site characterization, and then the phase of uh, development and operation, including uh, injection. And then the last two phases uh, that uh, included the, the closure and the transfer uh, to the state of the responsibility. Uh, during all the, all the cycles, um, uh, monitoring is, pre is, is present. And uh, during the first uh, the first part of the of the of the CCS storage, uh, this is, the monitoring is focused on the construction of the so-called baseline, which means uh, the uh, geophysical and geochemical description of the site at the at the, its initial conditions. Uh, and that is very important because uh, this data this, this data set, uh, will be useful. Uh, uh, will be used as a reference during uh, um, to compare the variation of the measured uh, parameters during the operations. Um, of course, uh, uh, there is also the operational monitoring, uh, which is already described by the other um, the other presentations, and uh, it will be active during the operation and. Uh, um, and uh, during this phase, the, 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 all the surveys that uh, was already done, were already done uh, in, the, um, in the first phase uh, were repeated uh, in the same condition uh, to compare the results. In this phase also, uh, the, um, the monitoring will be focused not only on the natural parameters, as pressure, temperature, and so on, but also to the condition of the infrastructures, uh, uh, especially wells and pipelines uh, to to assure uh, safety uh, operations. Uh, and then the last uh, the last part of the of the um, uh, of the um, uh, the monitoring um, is very important and is focus on the long term monitoring. They will consist uh, uh, on the on the control of the site uh, for at least other twenty years. 30 30 years after the, the end of the operations. And um, uh, also during this, I'm sorry, also during this, uh, this uh, phases, uh, there will be uh, different responsibility. Uh, in the first uh, ones, uh, the responsibility is, uh, is uh, of the site owners. And uh, whereas in the, in the last one, in the last phase, uh, after the transfer of the responsibility to the member state, uh, the, um, the long-term uh, monitoring is uh, uh, under the, uh, the um, control of the competent authority. Uh, the directive also specify, um, indicates uh, which are the parameters and uh, the processes that has to be monitored uh, in a mandatory way. And it is regards the reservoir uh, condition, uh, especially pressure and temperatures, temperature, and also the parameter that uh, needed uh, they are needed to define the volume injected. So the um, volumetric flow, the, the the flow rate, the chemical uh, condition of the CO2, uh, and the reservoir temperature and pressure, and that's very very important also in, in, especially in Europe, um, because. Uh, 
um, in Europe because uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's connected with the carbon credits uh, calculations. And um, um, uh, also uh, in uh, um, the, the, the directive uh, um, require a particular focus on, on the um, specifically to the infrastructure. Um, or in the, um, uh, but in reality, the request of the directive uh, uh, is uh, require a more complex uh, monitoring plan to con to assure some uh, aspect that are the the ones listed there. Uh, first of all, the uh, the containment which means that um, uh, the, the operations uh, uh, as to show that uh, the CO2 is securely stored. And this, is, uh, this means that uh, as we, um, the operation, the, the operator has to be sure that uh, there's no unexpected migration of CO2. And uh, this is also linked uh, in Europe with the quantification of the CO2 stored um, uh, for the European Emission Trading Scheme. And also uh, the other important uh, uh, point is the conformance um, has to be um, uh, proven that uh, uh, the measurements are in agreement with the simulations uh, to show that, um, that the operators has a, a good, uh, uh, um, that the the operators has a, has a good uh, knowledge of the uh, site storage processes. But also um, there are um, requirements uh, regarding the contingency monitoring, which means uh, uh, the monitoring plan that uh, has to be adopted in the case of no conformance. So if somebody, some, something is not uh, in, the, in line with the, uh, with the simulation, uh, there, um, there must be uh, an action of uh, remediation and also a monitoring plan dedicated to the remediation uh, uh, activities. And uh, uh, at, the, at the end, the, the another important aspect uh, that is to be assured is the uh, environmental impact. And this is um, uh, especially in the shallow part of the of the. Um, of the CO2 site system, but uh, uh, but this is very important also because uh, it's the link with the um, um, with the community and the um, local authorities, and uh, it's also it, 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 in this way it is very important to uh, to demonstrate that uh, the, the the environmental impact is uh, is kept as as low as possible. Um, in the last uh, in the last twenty years, uh, uh, numerous injection projects, from small injection pilots uh, to much larger commercial operation, have hosted uh, the development of required parameters, uh, with the aims to satisfy the request of the regulations, and to allow the um, deployment and um, and allow the deployment of new technology. To demonstrate uh, 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 containment, conformance, and no environmental impact. In the scheme that that I put here is uh, some of the of the sites. Uh, some of them are um, experimental ones. Other are um, commercial ones. Um, and uh, you can see that um, the, the red the red uh, monitoring activities are. Uh, uh, let's say mandatory, and uh, the blue ones are uh, developed uh, under research activities, uh, which means that uh, uh, um, that in the last 20 years a lot of activity was done to improve uh, the monitoring uh, um, strategies. Um, in general, we can distinguish uh, a deep monitoring and a shallow one. The deep monitoring uh, has uh, focus on the uh, as a target that is the reservoir and its behavior, uh, and, um, and which means mainly mapping the CO2 path uh, uh, at depth. 
and uh, whereas the shallow monitoring is focused on the uh, the impact on the um, um, on the surface. Uh, so with the aims to assure that there's no leakage at the surface and also to assuring uh, environmental impact. On the, on the right, you can see other, other um, sites, experimental and, and um, uh, commercial ones, and also oh, some of the uh, Europe uh, Horizon 2020 project that uh, funded uh, research on um, uh, monitoring uh, development. Uh, oops. Okay. Uh, one of the best experience regarding deep monitoring is the Sleipner. Uh, Sleipner is a commercial site uh, in the North Sea. Uh, the operation starts in 1996. And here they developed the time lapse analysis. Uh, this is based on the repetition of the seismic survey through time and the, on the comparison between the signals from the baseline survey uh, when uh, there's no, there wasn't any CO2 and the other surveys during, during the injection. Uh, the comparison also allowed to map CO2 in the store, in the reservoir and to monitor in the behavior. Uh, in also, this technique was in also called a 4D seismic because it introduced the time factor into the seismic, se se uh, seismic survey acquisition procedure. Um, another interesting system uh, developed in the last uh, in the last years uh, came from Insala in Algeria. Uh, here uh, they used the Insala system uh, uh, to um, include it in the monitoring plan, and uh, it was used to, uh, here for the first time and allowed uh, to individuate some criticity uh, connected to uh, during the operation connecting to the anomalous uh, um, behavior of a fault that induce some uh, uh, induce the, um, uh, an anomalous uplift in the surface. And um, the interesting uh, uh, aspect here is that uh, INSAVE was uh, included in the, uh, in the monitoring and also the data from the, the, um, uh, the survey was also went it, uh, integrated with the rock mechanics behavior to obtain uh, more representative and predictive uh, geomechanical models. And now this uh, procedure is considered uh, a new field of, uh, of, uh, of research. Um, considering new frontiers, uh, seismic acquisition is uh, generally expensive and, of, and, of, and often is uh, the object of a lot of discussion in the um, community and um, local authority and um, public. Uh, uh, but um, it's not possible for, to, to think about uh, a good uh, high quality monitoring plan without uh, seismic. So um, the scientific community in collaboration with the industry and site owners is going to develop system with lower environmental impact and uh, uh, easier and cheaper acquisition cost and procedures. Uh, I put here the example from Otway and Aquistar. Uh, both of them are experimental site where the net of, re um, uh, the net of receivers uh, are fixed and buried uh, under the surface and, uh, <clears throat> and into the monitoring well. They, they used uh, both uh, uh, geophones uh, array and um, distributed acoustic sensors to improve the, the, the acquisition. And also uh, in, uh, in Otway, uh, they put uh, also the source uh, uh, fixed, um, uh, which allowed to improve the quality of the acquisition because the, the the impulse uh, was, was uh, always the, the same and strongly reduced the environmental impact um, because uh, the, 
the source is very fast in time, very um, uh, reduced time. Uh, the impulse is very localized, and also it's not necessary to uh, to have a big um, you know infrastructure to um, to produce uh, mechanical uh, waves. So no trucks around, no no ships, uh, and no, a lot of people that work on the surface. Um, Sorry. Okay. Um, um, regarding the geochemical monitoring, even in this case, uh, um, <clears throat> the measurements can be divided in uh, measurements uh, uh, dedicated applied to the to the deep monitoring. So essentially, fluid of, of the reservoir. Uh, but also, it's very important uh, the um, the application of both the reservoir, so the impact in groundwater, soil, uh, and the water column in, in the sea and the atmosphere. Um, uh, the main aspect uh, to highlight here is that the regulation requi requirements are satisfied through a great amount of data, because the geochemical monitoring, although are direct measurements, are very punctual represent just uh, uh, the, that moment uh, during during the sample and that place um, very very localized and that can be a limitation in the purpose to assure conformance and quantification um, you can see the the, the, um, the sample strategies of uh, um, groundwater the water in the reservoir in Weibo. Uh, for this reason, uh, for this reason, uh, sorry, it's a little bit. Uh, uh, for this reason, a uh, geographical monitoring uh, uh, in the last years has the target to cover monitoring in a more continuous way, uh, both in, sp in time and space. Um, what I show here is one of the numerous uh, instruments dedicated to this purpose and deployed uh, by Sapienza University and my uh, the Tectonic and Chemistry Lab. Uh, this probe is uh, named the gas pro and is able to measure every 10 minutes uh, the concentration of CO2 and uh, it can put in the air, uh, buried in the, in the soil or also in, in water, in seawater. And has been tested in many experimental sites all over the world. You can see uh, some of the sites where they, it, it, uh, this is Gaspro is used for CO2 monitoring. And uh, on the right, you can see the um, results of one of the one year of measurements in the Asgard uh, um, uh, experimental site in the UK. Um, Uh, the next step, also for the geochemical uh, um, uh, monitoring, is try to improve also uh, the um, continuously uh, the continuity in in space. And to do this, uh, um, the Sapienza and also uh, BGS uh, um, developed a different kind of uh, instruments. This one uh, on the on the left is a very first prototype when um, uh, they they put on uh, the same trail, able to move uh, um, uh, uh, um, different kind of instruments, the gas pro, the laser, and uh, also the um, los gatos uh, to to measure isotopes. Uh, and this is these instruments are able to measure the CO2 concentration in first five centimeters from the surface, and uh, this uh, this uh, approach uh, can um, guarantee uh, the possibility to cover large area in uh, small time. Uh, on the right, you see the same uh, the same instruments in a more uh, you know. Um, um, uh, in, in a version, in a, in a younger version, let's say, and um, we improve in the in the capacity to in the accuracy of the GPS and in the frequency of the measurements every five, uh, five, uh, uh, four, uh, 
seconds. Uh, uh, this is an example of the excellent, excellent uh, results. Uh, on the left, you see the um, um, a survey, a classical survey um, uh, that uh, required about uh, uh, ten hours. And uh, on the on the um, on the left, and, uh, on the right, you see the same results with the mapper that uh, required just uh, uh, just thirty minutes to cover the same area with more continuity and with the same uh, resolution uh, uh, with the same resolution. Um, so um, monitoring, monitoring is also another important aspect that is the ability to control the environmental impact, uh, which is considered very important. And that has been the reason of a lot of limitation of CO2 geological storage development. The needs to guarantee uh, also this aspect leads to the integration of the monitoring plan with risk assessment and to, the, um, um, and to the need to develop instruments of monitoring in the light of uh, the potential risk. Uh, and this approach, so the integration with, uh, with, um, uh, with um, the risks, uh, um, or, uh, leads to the monitoring verific and verification and also bring us back to the regulation requirement requirements and to the regulation uh, at the beginning of this uh, presentation and also uh, highlight the paradox that uh, although scientific and technical progress is provided high quality instruments and methods uh, the regulation seems not to be aligned with these progresses and this is confirmed by the fact that the most of the operational sites operate under the oil and gas regulation instead of the uh, European directive, and that a lot of the European countries still do not develop the operative uh, regulation to follow uh, the directive itself. So here are my conclusions. Um, great effort has been spent in the last 20 years uh, of research and operation in pilot, demo, and industrial projects, sites, um, to develop uh, um, a more um, um, oper uh, efficiency monitoring technique um, that guarantee the targets required by, by the, the regulations. Um, and uh, this, uh, in this project, uh, the, these techniques demonstrated the containment, conformance, environmental impact can be monitored with a good degree of certainty. And, uh, and uh, that uh, this uh, degree of certainty is appropriated uh, to, to storage project. And, uh, but still uh, remains some uh, aspect uh, that has to be guaranteed in the effort to align regulation requirements, avoiding uh, the interpretation that risks to limit CCS development. Okay, thanks a lot for your kind attention. Thanks, Sabina, a lot to be here. Now, so we can proceed with uh, Jörg Arnes, Global Lead Low Carbon Oil and Gas at DMVGL. His speech is focusing on risk management. The floor is yours. Thank you, Massimiliano, and uh, thanks to the SPE's uh, Italian section for inviting me uh, to be part of this. So I will go through some of the uh, basic concepts related to risk evaluation for CO2 storage projects and building on the number of CO2 storage projects around the world that we have had the opportunity to participate in. So uh, first of all, I'd like to start by, uh, let me see if I can flip the screen, talking about the, the most basic concept about risk or the term risk. Uh, we tend to think about uh, risk as the combination of the probability of an undesirable event occurring and the impact of that event. 
but in fact, when the ISO standard on risk management, as well as in the ISO standard for CO2 storage, uh, risk is defined as the effect of uncertainty on project objectives. And I find it illuminating to think about uh, risk in this manner, and particularly for CO2 storage projects. We um, start more or less with a, a big black hole in a way, and we can gather some evidence about what that black hole looks like through different types of monitoring techniques that we've been hearing about. Seismic, we can drill wells, take samples, uh, we can do modeling and so forth. Uh, and all of this will reduce our uncertainty and gather more data, but there will always be uncertainty. Uh, that will, might impact project objectives. We heard Philip talking about uh, the lack of continu uh, continuity uh, in the reservoir, which is one element. We can map the, uh, the overburden, but we can still sort of not be completely sure that there isn't sort of a, a pathway through that overburden. And that means that there will always be a risk, but by un narrowing down the uncertainty, we're also excluding uh, the possibility of certain undesirable events from occurring and therefore also helping to reduce risk. So throughout this talk, you'll see that I'll be talking about risk and uncertainty as a two type of mirror concept and I'll be uh, repeating myself when it comes to um, the, that as aspect. And to try to understand how uh, we can manage a risk throughout uh, our project life, we also can think about how to sort of reduce the uncertainty throughout a project life. In fact, in the ISO standard uh, in the screening stage, it says that uh, one of the main purposes of uh, site screening and site characterization is to demonstrate that risk posed by site-specific characteristics can be reduced to acceptable levels by reducing geological uncertainty and by including appropriate risk treatment in the design, engineering and operation. So uh, to demonstrate that risk and therefore also sort of the, the level of uncertainty uh, is being reduced throughout the project life. This, uh, what you see on this screen is a, a conceptual picture indicating uh, the type of knowledge or uh, accuracy that you know about oil initially in place for an oil and gas field development. And you can see that from during the initial exploration stage, the uncertainty might be large in this uh, graphic indicated as plus minus 50%. But as you gather more data, uh, doing either uh, drilling more wells or, or adding seismic surveys, you sort of gradually uh, reducing that uh, uncertainty. And that concept can be mirrored by assessing the CO2 storage capacity that you have in a CO2 storage project. And before you start, you can do always assessments of that storage capacity, but as you do make appraisal wells and do modeling, you get uh, data points from uh, the injection operations, uh, you can sort of uh, continue to narrow down that, uh, that uh, uncertainty. And this is intrinsic to the idea of how to uh, mature and develop a CO2 storage project. You need to reduce the uncertainty to the levels that you need to be able to pass certain decision gates in order to take the investment decision, in order to be able to meet the, the re threshold uh, required by regulators for issuing a storage permit. And then the ultimate, uh, let's say, uh, threshold is the closure stage where you will need to be able to reduce the uncertainty and demonstrate that the risk is acceptable so that they can take over the uh, liability and responsibility for the site. And I'll get back to that. So there's different ways of uh, dealing with uncertainty through uh, a project. Uh, what you're seeing here is a concept that is being used in something called uh, evidence-based logic. Uh, and the way this works is that you can start with a, a certain hypothesis. You might have uh, what you call a root hypothesis. And a root hypothesis might, for CO2 storage might be that uh, the site has sufficient capacity or that the site uh, will allow uh, sufficient injectivity through uh, a dedicated number of wells or that the site will provide containment of the CO2 uh, um, throughout the project life. and. Uh, also beyond uh, project life. Trying to just assess the uncertainty on, at that level uh, is often impractical. You might need to break it down to, let's say, sub-hypothesis. Uh, 
that by combined uh, sort of uh, provide additional evidence for the uh, root hypothesis. And by doing that, you have a systematic way of breaking down your sort of the evidence that you need to be able to demonstrate the, the top level criteria. And at the sub uh, hypothesis level, you might uh, be able to gather evidence for or against that hypothesis. So let's say that you have a, a, a particular fault and you would like to understand if uh, that fault can be reactivated uh, by the pressure increase that you might get from the CO2 storage injection. That is a specific sub-hypothesis and that might be lead to uh, a possible flow pathway through that fault. So then you can gather the type of evidence that you ha might have that would say that that is not uh, a likely scenario. And then there might be other evidence saying, indicating that there is a possibility that that can occur. And then you can identify what uh, type of evidence do you not have. And this is sort of called the, the white space. So Shell has, for instance, uh, actively used this type of methodology to try to understand what they know and what they don't know. And that also uh, provides guidance on what kind of additional activities that they might need to do to narrow down uh, the uncertainty and therefore also reduce the risk. So while talking about Shell, this is uh, the risk matrix that they were, were using for the Quest CCS project that we also had the opportunity to work with uh, Quest on. Uh, and that's two points I guess I would like to, to talk about with regards to this matrix. First of all, uh, it's the probability scales, which is quite different from what you might see in an engineering uh, type project. Uh, let's say you have a, a tank consisting of uh, ammonia or you have a tank consisting of hydrogen for that matter and you would like to understand the uh, risk of that uh, tank uh, rupturing uh, or, or creating a significant incident. Those type of probability scales are often exponential and you're looking at the numbers like 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4 and so forth. But here you can see the probability scales are uh, in the lowest corner here from 0 to 5% or uh, 80 to 100%. And if you think about uh, a scenario like uh, CO2 leakage uh, from a reservoir, uh, having a, a thinking that that could be in the range of 5 to 20% might be unacceptable uh, in many situations. And therefore that uh, limits the sort of number of categories that you might have available. Uh, in many projects, you have uh, different types of probability scales. This is just one example, but it's still an example of a project that uh, is actively operating a CO2 storage project. Uh, on the risk categories, you'll see different uh, type of risk categories. Uh, and uh, those different risk categories are typically tuned to the different uh, projects. Uh, they could reflect the, the different uh, geographical context, they can uh, reflect the different size of the project, they can def uh, reflect the operator that is operating the project and so forth. But the important thing here is that uh, there is a consistency between the uh, descriptions for the same level of, comp uh, of, uh, of impact. So if you're looking at, for instance, the, the medium impact uh, category, you'll see uh, that it says the cost impact is a 20 to $25 million uh, impact. The schedule to the financial investment decision uh, or delay there is one to three months. Uh, the system capacity, and they're talking about a 15 to 20% downtime. And what I'm trying to say here is that each of those categories needs to sort of be considered as equally um, damaging, you might say, to, to the project itself. So it has, uh, taking this back to the uh, definition of risk, the impact of uncertainty on objectives. So in terms of the project objectives, it should have the equally sort of detrimental effect on the project objectives. A common concept that has been used within the oil and gas industry, it's called a LARP. This is, is uh, as low as reasonably practical. And it reflects the thinking that uh, you should, uh, that first of all, that uh, when you do an activity, there will always be risk, but risk should not outweigh the benefit of doing an activity. Secondly, uh, there's also always opportunities to reduce risk, but uh, at some point, the sort of additional cost of continuous or further risk reduction might outweigh the benefits of that additional uh, risk reduction. So 
uh, that in indicates that there is a sort of a scale that you need to take into account. But uh, in most projects, there's certainly an area where risk is not justified. Uh, it's not justified to, to be expecting fatalities from a, uh, an activity in general. Whereas there's another region that is generally broadly acceptable. We, we drive cars on the road. We know there's a risk associated with that. But because the benefit of driving a car is something that uh, we all sort of seek and we're willing to take the risk of, of driving a car by getting that benefit. But in between those two, there is often a, a sort of a region which is not clearly broadly acceptable and it's not clearly unacceptable. And when, when within that region, which is often called region, you might need to uh, decide sort of uh, what are the... Uh, what are the sort of mitigating measures that you need to put in place and, and where do you stop? What you see on the right hand side here is the definitions that are used as part of the ISO standard for CO2 storage. And here you can see that uh, this all ARP region is referred to as the tolerable risk, where risk is considered as temporarily or conditionally acceptable. And um, perhaps just to provide one example here is that uh, let's say there's a, a well within the site that you know have a poor uh, integrity. So uh, the project is designed so that the CO2 will not be, or that well, well will not be exposed to CO2. So you're putting your ejection wells and basically designing the, the operation so that CO2 will not come in contact with that well. So in, under that circumstance, you're saying that, okay, the, the risk of having that well without sort of re-entering that well and, and uh, let's say re-abandoning that well is acceptable. But the, that means that you need to take a put in place, let's say monitoring uh, solutions that can uh, be able to demonstrate that CO2 is not uh, progressing towards that well uh, so that you can manage that risk acceptably. And that's uh, one example of what you might call a tolerable uh, risk. Uh, and it's sort of temporarily uh, acceptable in the sense that it's uh, acceptable as long as you don't get CO2 exposure or that you have a monitoring system in place that can uh, be able to ensure that that, that is not, uh, well, is not exposed to CO2. Um, and then one more step uh, further. So in uh, how do you convince, let's say, uh, an regulator that uh, your risk is acceptable or in this tolerable region? And uh, what uh, sort of a measures do you need to put in place? Uh, this bow tie that you're seeing here is also taken from the Quest CCS project, and I think it's quite uh, illustrating. Uh, and it's, uh, it was partly used as a mechanism for, for Shell to demonstrate to the uh, regulators in Alberta that the risk uh, was, can be taken down to an acceptable level. They actually use this as part of also a, a quantitative way of uh, quantifying the risk of leakage. But uh, for now, I'll take that point aside. I'd rather talk about how they uh, put this uh, bow tie together. So first of all, you see that there's different types of threats that you have on the left-hand side. And for each threat, you have some light blue boxes and you have some dark blue boxes. The light blue boxes refer to uh, barriers to loss of containment that are inherently in place. That could be uh, that you have a certain ceiling uh, formation above the storage site. It could mean that you have an overpressure in an aquifer above the, the site. Uh, and there's sort of other things, but they are sort of inherently in place either by design or by, uh, by nature. The dark blue boxes, they are boxes that relate to uh, monitoring that is intended to detect an early warning signal that leakage might be occurring or uh, might uh, occur if nothing is done uh, to stop it. Uh, and these dark blue boxes, they have three different uh, elements. First of all, it's the monitoring element. So there's a sensor capable of detecting a change intended to provide an early indication that some form of intervention is required. So this is the sensing uh, component. Uh, on top of that, there's a decision logic to interpret if the sensor uh, data and then select an intervention. And then the uh, latter part is actually to implement that uh, intervention. And in terms of having a barrier towards loss of containment, you need to have uh, all three. 
But by putting together a bow tie like this, uh, Shell was able to enter into a conversation with a regulator, indicating sort of how, how much, uh, how many barriers do they need to put in place to be able to, to manage the risk at an acceptable level. So this is a way for Quest to, to demonstrate ALARP through a bow tie methodology. Another important aspect of risk uh, evaluation is how to set the uh, acceptance criteria. And uh, I'm gonna take an example for the Weyburn project that was developed back in 2006 to 2007, I believe. And at the time, the uh, thinking around uh, CO2 storage was a little bit different. Uh, one of the main concepts that were floating around is that it would be acceptable with uh, if 1% uh, of the CO2 that was injected would leak. And that thinking was founded on the thinking that uh, if we inject CO2 and can ensure that 99% of the CO2 stays there, then that's still better than 100% of the CO2 leaving not sort of particularly putting in regard uh, sort of the environmental impacts. So uh, the way they define the, con, uh, the acceptance criteria here is that there should be 80% uh, confidence that not more than 1% of the CO2 injected uh, would be leaking. And there should be 95% confidence that uh, there was not a leakage from one single uh, pathway uh, of more than 1%. And uh, they put together this table and you can see there's sort of the total containment risk, which is here a couple of magnitudes uh, lower than the acceptance threshold, which is all good. But uh, the point I wanted to make here is that uh, the amount of leakage and, and perhaps environmental damage is just one component of this. In general, uh, CO2 migration from a CO2 reservoir might have a, a very benign or uh, insignificant impact. But there's other impacts that also needs to be considered. It's the potential litigations, it's the potential uh, cost components, it's a potential reputation, and it could also impact a full industry if there's no confidence in CCS. So the current uh, situation is that regulations uh, do not allow you to have any leakage, basically. You need to be able to uh, demonstrate that you've selected a site that will provide complete, complete and permanent leakage. This is the case in all jurisdictions that have a tailored CCS regulation. And if there is leakage, then that, that's actually a breach of uh, license conditions and requires intermediate, uh, in immediate intervention. If you have leakage along a well, it's acceptable that you can sort of fix that well and continue to operate. operate. But if you have leakage uh, through, uh, let's say a fault zone that you're not able to stop, then that will also uh, very likely terminate the project. So in that sense, uh, the impact on the project is uh, is fundamental. It's, it will stop the project and the reputation to the operator is uh, also quite det detrimental. And the, those things would indicate that uh, having an acceptable level of leakage is not accepted. The ISO standard says that uh, regulatory authorities shall be consulted when establishing risk evaluation criteria for, for elements of concern that are relevant for regulatory approvals. In general, that stakeholders may be uh, consulted for uh, evaluation criteria that can affect the stakeholders in a material way. Um, I think I don't want to go into more details on this, but uh, how to distinguish between the uh, different uh, levels of risk uh, can be based on both political concerns, economic considerations, and additional uh, aspects. Uh, in order to understand uh, environmental risk, uh, on the surface, we um, know that if I mean CO2 leaks uh, to the surface, it will generally dissipate quickly. Uh, this not, might not be as, e as simple in offshore environments. And for offshore environments, this particular methodology has been developed through uh, the ECO2 project that was uh, mentioned by, uh, by Sabina. Uh, and uh, this is also something that we've been using for the Northern Lights project to help them uh, translate the results of the risk assessment for the project to a potential environmental, em environmental impact, which they needed to report as part of their environmental impact assessment. The way to do this uh, was first of all to identify the valuable uh, environmental resources, uh, assess the value to them. That's the first box here. 
Uh, and that is uh, put into this uh, consequence matrix or the risk uh, matrix in step four. But then in order to understand the severity of impact, we first of all take a look at the where you might have uh, the potential, or where the CO2 plume might be, where you have potential leak features, and where you have an overlap with a potential leakage and the valuable resource. Once you know that, then you can, within uh, those areas, you can uh, try to identify the sensitivity of those uh, environmental resources to uh, migration of CO2. In fact, if you have a, a quite small migration of CO2 to the, to the seafloor, it will quite quickly dissolve in water and uh, have a, a typically a very local uh, range and will have a very limited impact. If you have larger releases, then uh, some of that CO2 will might actually uh, reach the surface uh, as well. Uh, but in general, uh, for, for small leakages, uh, all, all the CO2 might never uh, reach the surface. And then you can use that to, to translate the, uh, the impact on the vulnerable resources and uh, put that together into an environmental risk assessment. So that would be sort of an additional aspect on top of uh, the ordinary geos, um, geosphere risk assessment. So this is my final slide. Uh, I wanted, wanted to tie back to the initial thinking about uh, managing down the uncertainty through the project life. Uh, this shows uh, the different milestones that you might have in the progress of a CO2 uh, storage project. Uh, it also reflects uh, the different type of certificates that, uh, that DNVGL offers or DNV offers when we provide independent uh, certification of projects. Um, and uh, this is based on the ISO standard uh, for CO2 storage, the ISO 27914. I initially talked about the uh, point in time where uh, the operator might want to trans uh, or uh, hand over the responsibility and liability to the uh, authorities. Uh, in all regulations that you have uh, in the world today, there is a time-based criteria for, uh, for closure uh, indicating that you will need to monitor for as a default 20 years uh, in Europe after you stop injection. In the US it's 50 years, in Alberta it's 10, and in uh, Australia it's 15. Nonetheless, there is a time-based criteria, and that does not distinguish between the risk levels for different projects. Uh, the ISO standard takes a step away from uh, time-based criteria and only defines technical criteria for closure. So the thinking here is that uh, an operator might want to demonstrate conformity with the, uh, the ISO standard. And once they've just demonstrated those technical criteria, they can enter into a conversation with the government to uh, try to shorten the period that they need to do monitoring post, uh, post injection. Um, so this is uh, just an example of, uh, of that. Uh, and the ISO standard also talks about that the closer qualification process should demonstrate that risk and uncertainty have gradually uh, been reduced and managed throughout the project lifecycle, which then also speaks to the need to, uh, to be able to document how you're managing uncertainty and how you're managing uh, risk throughout the project life. And uh, that was my final uh, slide. So thank you all for uh, listening. Thanks again, uh, Jörg Tobia. Now the last speaker, Samuela Vercelli, research leader at La Sapienza University of Rome. She will talk about the impact of CCS in society. The question form I remind that is active. You, have, you still have a few minutes to ask your question. Thanks, uh, Samuela. It's your turn, please. Uh, thank you, Massimiliano. Um, and thank you to uh, everyone listening to this uh, webinar, I hope you are not too tired after all these presentations. We will speak now about the social aspects of um, CO2 storage and CCS more in general. And um, uh, sorry, but try to use the mouse, Samuela. Uh, Clicking. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, so um, in my presentation, uh, I, I would like to first of all uh, show you this uh, image. Uh, it's uh, a photograph taken uh, during a multi-stakeholder meeting for the Iron Dialogue project. And um, 
I'm showing it to you just at the beginning of my presentation to show you something that we really need and is now still missing in, uh, in, uh, in the energy transition in general and for CCS uh, 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 in particular. So I will um, now uh, explain a little bit about the approach we uh, have taken for the study of uh, social aspects of CCS. And um, then we will speak briefly about the present situation of CCS in our society and the potential benefit of working on stakeholders relationships uh, to uh, speed up the, the energy transition and, and the implementation of innovative technologies like CCS. And uh, I will give you an example uh, from the r and experience of how this kind of uh, approach and work can benefit uh, um, uh, our work towards a low carbon society. So the problems uh, at social level are, are often discussed uh, in, in the common terms used are, for instance, uh, the term public acceptance or the not in my backyard syndrome. Um, we, we all the time we uh, complain about the slow progress of the energy transition. And, and we know that uh, there is often a lack of support of the stakeholders for the introduction of new technologies, uh, especially large scale technologies like CCS, but uh, not only CCS, also wind or other, other uh, large scale technologies. And um, in our laboratory, we work in a multidisciplinary uh, relationship and um, between uh, geological engineering and, uh, and social science uh, uh, researchers. And in particular, I cover the uh, the social aspects and um, with the uh, focus on, on psychosocial um, dimensions, which means uh, essentially that uh, with regard to the problems I just mentioned, uh, it's uh, you can easily imagine that there are a lot of emotions involved. And uh, in my work, I try to understand how these emotions work in the relationships uh, uh, among the stakeholders, but also uh, in the relationship that we have uh, in uh, um, towards uh, the technology, towards uh, all the issues related to, to, to the climate uh, issues and uh, uh, all the issues related to reducing the uh, impact of um, energy technologies on, on the environment and making them more and more efficient and, uh, and less costly and environmentally sustainable. So we have worked in several European projects trying to work out how from this present situation where often uh, negative emotions, uh, emotions are never negative, but just to, to have a, a common, uh, a common uh, phrasing uh, which can help understand each other. So protest or conflict uh, can uh, uh, be transformed in something that helps people work together and, and find solutions and implement them in time for uh, the transformation of our society in a more sustainable way. So, if we look at uh, CCS uh, in our society from the point of view of the technology itself, we we know that uh, CCS can do a lot to decarbonize our world. Uh, already uh, a colleague before, uh, I think uh, it was Philippe Legrand, uh, was mentioning the different uh, areas of application of CCS. So, in fact, uh, it can be very, very useful to decarbonize power, heavy industry. Uh, we can go carbon negative with bio energy CCS and, and direct air capture CCS, and also for the production of synthetic fuels, which could be really uh, a very important uh, option to, to, to make a, an energy system which does not consume resources but can recycle resources and, and therefore become much more sustainable and also for hydrogen production. So, in fact, we, we know from many studies now that uh, uh, CCS can do a lot. CCS can also reduce whole system energy costs and does the cost to the consumer and of course create jobs uh, and uh, here there is a, a reference from the literature which uh, is very interesting for giving you a complete overview of, of the situation. 
So if we instead look at CCS in, in our society at social level, we find a completely different uh, situation. We would expect, okay, this technology is potentially so important to uh, mitigate climate change, to improve the sustainability of the energy system. Uh, so we would expect, you know, everyone would be aware of this technology and everyone would be eager to implement it. Instead, the situation is completely, completely different. Um, from a psychological point of view, we could say that CCS has been developed uh, in, a, in a rather isolated way. What does this mean? That uh, a lot, a lot of work has been done by the researchers, by the companies, by, uh, in some cases, also by uh, regulators. Uh, but uh, all this um, uh, huge amount of work has not reached the public and uh, perhaps even worse, has not reached many of the decision makers who, who are uh, the ones who, who really need to know about new technologies and, uh, and uh, re need to know about them quite in uh, detail to be able to, to make decisions and, um, and good decisions. So, in fact, we have very low public awareness and this hasn't changed very much in the last 20 years. And therefore, there is no common representation of this technology in our society. Uh, if, I, if I speak about CCS, uh, most people don't really know what it is. And, and even those people who have heard about it, um, most of the time don't really know what it is. Uh, therefore, the gap between science uh, and society and between the technological implementers and society is still very big. There is little, let's say, there is not much direct communication. Therefore, information doesn't reach uh, um, people and, as I said, decision makers. The development of technology is progressing quite slow and, uh, um, in particular, much slow, much more slowly than it was expected uh, following the, the, the common roadmaps uh, that we experts that we people working in the in the in the ccs community um were uh, relying upon and and expecting to 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 be implemented for instance the zero emission platform um uh, forecasted 12 to 15 uh, ccs demonstration projects by 2015 and we are in 2021 and none of them in europe i mean and none of them has been has been uh, um, implemented uh, so in fact we have still uh, in a small number of pilot and demonstration projects uh, my colleagues uh, before have shown you some uh, maps uh, so you can get a, a, an idea also looking on, on the global ccs institute uh, um, website and uh, we, we have uh, seen all the time quite mild uh, or shaky policy support, shaky in the sense that uh, uh, sometimes um, even funding or decisions already taken have been withdrawn uh, for, for many different reasons. But so in the end, the support <laughs> has been not so, uh, so strong. Okay, so... Uh, I'm trying to change my slide. I don't know why it's not working. Okay. So if we uh, uh, enlarge our perspective and uh, not not just look at CCS, but we look at the uh, at the context of uh, context of the energy transition, uh, we see uh, that in fact uh, uh, competition between technologies, for instance. Uh, very often we hear say, okay, we cannot, uh, uh, we have to choose between one and the other technology, uh, and conflict and resistance uh, to change and and uh, uh, to finding agreements which can be uh, adopted by everyone in a, in a, in a good uh, uh, with uh, with uh, good agreement. Uh, so all these is unfortunately, the norm. Uh, so we, we see a lot of roadmaps being, de being developed, but in the end, little progress and a lot of conflict. Therefore, the pace of the energy transition, as, uh, as I was already saying, is rather slow. 
not just for CCS, but in general for, for all the whole energy system. Uh, as, as you, uh, for certainly you know that uh, the composition of the of the of the energy production is is uh, still, or if we consider the whole world, uh, is still relying uh, very heavily on fossil fuels, and uh, uh, we still have to go a long way to 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 really see a significant uh, change in this respect. And as we have seen many times, agreements are difficult to achieve. Let's only think about the Paris Agreement uh, and all the work that was necessary to somehow find an agreement between so many countries all over the world. But then uh, even agreements which have been reached are not always easy to uh, follow up, follow on and, and implement. So, if we look at this wider perspective, we can see that it's not just a problem with CCS, but it's a much wider issue that we have to face. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the, the difficulties we, we meet with CCS are not so different from those of the, of the rest of the energy sector. So we can see that um, the different sectors are like uh, walking each one on their own. And uh, there is still very limited coordination and, and, uh, and development of, of, of a perspective, you know, which brings everything together. And uh, in particular, we, we can see there is a lack of connection, both among technologies, so carbon, solar, CCS, wind, so they are kind of progressing each one in their sector, and stakeholders. So it's quite unusual that people working in industry meet with people uh, working in civil society or political players meet with researchers and so on. So these, uh, not to say about local communities, which are even, even more out of uh, these kind of exchanges. So there is very uh, little connection between the different uh, social actors, which every one of them has a very important role to play and is playing a very important role in one way or the other. And uh, at the moment, they are not uh, working together. They are each one progressing on their own path. Uh, therefore, in, in our work, we have realized uh, the need to connect, to create connection. And uh, we have uh, worked to this with a holistic approach uh, so that we could uh, start to connect all the social players and the different technologies putting CCS in the, co in the wider context of the energy transition. So um, avoiding this kind of uh, focus on an exclusive focus on CCS and rather um, realizing that CCS is just part of a wider picture and therefore exploring how we can um, have a dialogue between the stakeholders so that we can understand the perspective of each one uh develop collaboration because collaboration is essential for finding solutions that everyone will be happy with and uh, and this point of view uh, and what is now called the win-win solutions is more and more recognized as the best way forward although of course there is a lot of resistance because uh, it, it's not always so obvious that there can be win-win solutions and uh, Therefore, um, uh, very often uh, there is a cultural issue to uh, the need to transform our way of thinking and and uh, and get started with uh, uh, different uh, collaboration uh, and uh, synergies between both different groups uh, and different uh, stakeholders and the collaboration. For instance, finding synergies between technologies uh, as we just said uh, ccs can be synergic with uh, uh, with wind uh, with hydrogen and so on but this is very very much um, um, well very little known let's say uh, and therefore we we really need to work to um, understand how these synergies can develop so what happened um, we experimented with multi-stakeholder dialogue in the r dialogue project, which was a, an FP7 project for creating a multi-stakeholder dialogue environment. 
uh, using a very innovative approach um, based on understanding of the perspective of each stakeholder, taking uh, each stakeholder perspective for good. And um, of course, uh, placing CCS in the context of the transformation towards a low carbon society. I, I refer here just one uh, interesting result, um, just to give you an example of, of what can happen. Um, in this project, we, when we set out to do this project, we thought, okay, we want to speak with all the stakeholders on some technologies, three or four technologies among which there was CCS, to understand, you know, how these technologies can work together and what what they all think about it and develop a common vision for, for the low carbon, for, to develop a low carbon society. What happened in reality is when we asked these people what they wanted, if this happened in 10 uh, European countries, there, there were 10 dialogues going on in 10 different European countries. So when we asked all these stakeholders, um, what they wanted to talk about, you know, for, for developing a vision towards the low carbon society. Interestingly, interestingly enough, they were not interested to, to speak about the technologies for themselves. So, in fact, the dialogues went on and only in a few cases and, uh, and um, uh, quite limited uh, portion of the time of the dialogue, the technologies were discussed. So, the technologies were not at the forefront, we're really at the back, and in some dialogues, not even discussed or very marginally discussed. At the end of the of the dialogues, we we had a questionnaire for you know for feedback and monitoring of the uh, dialogue action, and one of the questions was about uh, which of the technologies, uh, the following technologies that you can see in the in the figure. Um, the participants had learned something new uh, all during the dialogue action, taking into account that the dialogue action lasted uh, uh, quite a long time. So these stakeholders met more times uh, for one year, one and a half year or, or so. And, um, and uh, what it was uh, quite interesting to find out that most of the stakeholders uh, reported to have learned something new about practically all the technologies, but more than any other technology about CCS. So I think this is very interesting because, you know, CCS was not at all the, the focus of the dialogues. However, people did learn um, a lot about it and, and, um, and this uh, can be, uh, a good example of how we can achieve uh, uh, greater awareness of, of the technologies just by um, creating opportunities for people to discuss the problems of the energy transition and they themselves will, will look for, you know, learning uh, and, uh, and um, will be uh, spontaneously interested to learn about new technologies. So, uh, we can say that uh, in our case, uh, innovative uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue processes prove useful, first of all, to create opportunities for people to learn about, for participants to learn about technological uh, innovation options, and therefore raising awareness about uh, new technologies, uh, in the first place, CCS. And this is really important because very often we have very good solutions uh, to our problems, energy or other, uh, but they don't reach people and therefore they, they remain uh, unapplied. So this is really important. Uh, the processes of uh, dialogue processes uh, were also useful to connect to the stakeholders uh, in a uh, collaborative and problem solving mode, as you have seen the picture that I showed you at the beginning of my presentation, you can see these people, how they were concentrated and trying really to work together. Uh, and uh, you have no idea what kind of atmosphere can be created with these kind of processes and people really, you know, starting from completely different positions and one, uh, you know, uh, from, I don't know, coal and the other one from renewables. And then they start working together and, and they find uh, ideas uh, that they can share. 
So this really is very uh, helpful to overcome uh, business as usual, let's say conflict and resistance to change uh, and uh, difficulty in understanding the different perspectives. And, um, and uh, this kind of uh, processes was uh, also important to um, develop a whole system perspective uh, in, in, in our minds, all of us who participated, uh, which is really uh, useful to overcome isolation uh, and separation of the technologies, like each one in, in its own room. <laughs> in this way, we can come all together in one room, not just the people, but also the, the technologies. So conclusions is that um, the relationships among stakeholders uh, have a very important role, and it depends on us and uh, and our work to to um, achieve good, uh, efficient, functional relationships, so that we can speed up the energy transition and uh, get support from from all the from society as a whole, from all the stakeholders in our society. Um, and in this way, you know, through this uh, kind of uh, um, synergy and collaboration, um, we can probably uh, overcome uh, more easily present uh, uh, difficulties. And this could make the difference, uh, not just for CCS, but uh, for the energy transition overall. And um, Another thing that uh, is really important is that um, this kind of transformation, let's say, of the relationships uh, is uh, difficult to, to, to perceive, to catch, unless one really uh, has the opportunity to make some experience and have direct insight in what it means, you know, how it can change our way of thinking and how to improve problems in, in an indirect way, but very usefully and uh, therefore um, I advise you to download for instance this is an, an, an example the output of the Italian dialogue uh, just to get you know an idea <laughs> of of what kind of experience one can make when you put together in the same room uh, people from civil society industry politics and and uh, simple citizens, we, we also had the, the, the important contribution of, of citizens, local community citizens. Um, and you, get, you can get an idea of how this can make our vision for the future much uh, uh, richer and, uh, and give us, the, um, let's say, uh, the strength, uh, the social strength. I mean, you know, feeling that together we can um be much more impactful uh, in our efforts to uh, improve the uh, situation uh, of sustainability uh, in our in our world uh, uh, and therefore um, uh, recognize and and appreciate the contribution that uh, each social actor can bring to the to the energy transition so thank you everyone for your kind attention um, the funding for the project Island dialogue uh, is gratefully acknowledged to the european union and i want to give a special thank you to all my colleagues and and all the participants in many <coughs> in the order of thousands uh, to our dialogue project and of course you can contact me for any any questions and uh, on our youtube channel you can find uh, a number of videos that uh, uh, can be interesting for all the all the all by the way you can also find the videos of some of the activities we did with the local communities uh, and uh, and here are all the interesting inputs that uh, they brought to our to our work so thanks a lot uh, and I give back the, the word to Massimiliano thanks Samuela really appreciated your speech so now we can go directly to the last part of the event dedicated to question and answer session that so could start. Um, I collect all the questions received. I filter them, so sorry, because uh, we have time for one question for each speaker. So 
Uh, we can start uh, uh, from Marco Brignoli. Uh, Brignoli, we have um, a question for you. I, I read it, sorry. Which are the main differences or aspects to be evaluated during a geomechanical study regarding considering a water or CO2 injection? The floor is yours, Marco. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Massimiliano. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, if, uh, if you remember the slide I showed uh, over the, the the scheme of the balls regarding the what happens when someone injects something on the subsurface, I added one small uh, piece, uh, one small ball concerned specifically with CO2. Well, the main difference between water and CO2 injection is that uh, CO2 reacts with the formation, react with the wearable and uh, react uh, with, uh, with the cap rock. And so it might induce uh, variation on the properties, petrophysical, mechanical, and, and thus this is not uh, preventing uh, the, the injection to take place and this is not preventing the, the, the cap rock to fail, but of course, uh, since it has to be taken into account, um, we need to uh, understand and we need to model uh, how the action will impact over over the, 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 the entire subsurface chain. So starting from the injection well to the uh, other existing wells, the formation, the cap rock uh, and the folds. And this is done by different studies, different uh, approaches, uh, geo studying the, geo the geochemistry of the interaction between CO2 and the formation, the CO2 and the caprock and, and the cement. And if this variation can bring to substantial changes in the properties of uh, the material, whether it is the wellbore material or the subsurface material. Uh, it's a, it's a common uh, type of, of studies that uh, that are done. Me and I, uh, uh, the same as well for, for the other oil and gas companies or for the other consortia working on on a CO2 CO2 project. Uh, what what is uh, worth underlying is that those are differences to be taken into account. Um, both from the, the modeling and the monitoring point of view, but they are not um, such to uh, block, to constitute a short stop of, of the ongoing ongoing projects. I hope to, to adequately answer I, uh, to the- to I the guess, question. yes, Marco, thank you. Thank you again. Now, a question for Philippe Legrand. Is there potential for mineral harvesting from the endurance brine? Please, uh, Philippe, the floor is yours. Yes, again. thank you, <clears throat> Massimiliano. Um, I'm not sure to understand the question. Are we speaking of dissolution of the CO2 into the brine? Is it I, I guess yes. It's not me, the, the question doesn't arrive for yeah, me, it, it, I think, yes. If it is a question, the, we estimate the dissolution of the CO2 into the brine with such an hypersaline brine, very neglectable, meaning 1% maybe of the CO2 could be dissolved into the brine. <clears throat> so totally neg neglectable uh, effect. Thanks, Philippe. Yep, welcome. Oh, very quick, quick, but very useful uh, answer. Now we, I give the floor to Sabina Bigi uh, for a question. So I, again, I read it. You said that there are contacts and collaboration between different international research groups regarding monitoring, for example, gas leakage or for CCS analysis. Have you in Sapienza established projects with oil and gas or energy companies? Um, Sapienza is, um, yeah, of course, yes. 
we we Sapienza is one of the founder of the CO2 GeoNet uh, network of excellence, uh, which is a an European organization that deals with um, research on CCS. And there is a lot of um, um, research uh, institutes all over uh, Europe that works on to develop the monitoring systems. So the answer is, of course, yes. And also oh, a lot of this uh, institute uh, um, uh, collaborate together with the industries to, um, to develop this. So oh, yes, of course, yes. Thank you, Sabina. You're welcome. Now um, to Jörg Arnes. How do you think probabilistic approaches can be of benefit to support the decision making process related to a CCS project? Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, first of all, I think I should say that uh, probabilistic approaches are used to a very limited extent, uh, partly because uh, Monte Carlo type simulations are uh, typically uh, very, very time consuming and, uh, and modeling intensive. Uh, nonetheless, uh, several projects have tried to develop uh, more probabilistic or quantitative approaches. And this has to a large extent been driven by either the regulatory requirements or by stakeholders. So as an example, in Australia, there is a requirement that uh, you can demonstrate that any sort of migration pathway that uh, leads to loss of containment has a less than 10% chance of occurring. And that sort of begs the fact that you have sort of a probabilistic model that can sort of map out what the migration pathways will be. Quest used uh, a quantitative approach to be able to demonstrate that the loss of containment for the project was uh, broadly acceptable. So they was uh, used a quantitative way uh, combined with the bow tie to to provide uh, uh, an estimate of the sort of likelihood of uh, leakage occurring from any pathway. But I think the the primary driver for more probabilistic approaches might come from the financial stakeholders. And we've been uh, quite recently working with a, a customer in Asia that have asked us to support them in providing, let's say, probabilistic and, uh, and quantitative approaches that they can use towards uh, banks and financial lenders to support decision making with regards to investment into the projects. So if there's one clear domain that I think probabilistic approaches has an, uh, a value, it's, it's in that communication towards financial stakeholders. Thank, thanks, Jörg. Thanks, Jörg, for your exhaustive answer. Now, uh, the last question regarding to Samuela Vercelli. NIMBY protests have existed for decades in the energy sector. Do you notice any differences or salient aspects between those, those protests and the ones related to CCS issue specifically? Yes, thank you for this question. Um, so first of all, I have to say that for CCS, we have uh, just a few cases. Fortunately, it's more a fear of the, of the stakeholders or something that um, we know that uh, could uh, could be an issue, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, there have been a uh, few projects, so uh, fortunately, also a few cases of this uh, of this kind of problem. This said, uh, um, I would not say there are any uh, sunny differences because uh, in, usually it's really a, um, a, a, an issue of stakeholder relationships. So. Uh, usually these kind of, of problems are the consequence of long-term um, lack of, uh, of stakeholder uh, communication, collaboration, uh, interaction. Um, it has to be said that uh, each case is uh, unique uh, because uh, when we speak about this um, development of uh, human relationships, uh, especially at social level, there are so many factors interacting that uh, there is no case. Uh, I mean, they are really uh, unique and, and, and singular. However, uh, what is maybe noteworthy is that uh, more recently, the, the relevant, what, what could be seen just a local issue, for instance, uh, 
can reach a relevance uh, at national or even international level because uh, there is uh, a kind of interest uh, uh, to develop uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, political objective uh, depending on the stakeholders and therefore this is probably this kind of global dimension is probably uh, more recent uh, but I would not say it's uh, it's uh, linked to CCS uh, specifically but rather uh, although we have seen it also CCS but it's a, a more general problem. Thanks Samuela for the answer. Now I can say that the Q&A session could conclude. I want to remind you that is active the feedback form link that you could find below the YouTube video. For us, it would be really important uh, your opinion. Then I want to thank all the speakers and organizers for the collaboration and the high number of spectators for the participation, the interest and the question post. Uh, nothing else. Uh, remember to join our community. All our contents are in this slide that we will leave projected uh, for a few minutes after uh, the end of the event. Thank you and bye bye. See you soon.